Hello, everybody, and welcome to another conversation. Today, I'm going to be talking to Tiffany Riley and Melissa Holland, who are incredible, inspirational clown doctor leaders in the field of healthcare clowning. So stick around. It's just a conversation with a fellow clown. It's not very serious, we're clowning around. It's really just a clown All right, welcome everybody. If you're new to the Clown Spirit family, welcome, welcome. Please hit subscribe on the YouTube channel here, the Clown Spirit YouTube channel, and please like this video. Send us a like and, and share this video with your friends, folks. Our mission at Clown Spirit is to unleash as many clowns into the world as possible. And we use the power of clown to bring lightness, joy, and connection to your life and the lives of everybody around you. So if, if that's not a good mission, tell me what is. And please help us spread the word by sharing this video with your friends on Facebook and wherever. And wherever you are today, why not jump into the chat and say hi. There's a chat right next to the video that you're watching. And you can write into it and you can be part of this conversation, everybody. So why not jump in there right now and say hello. So already we have some people jumping in. Hi, Catfish from by Chicago. Wow, I love Chicago. I spent a lot of years in Chicago. Very cool place. All right. Who else do we have today? Who else and where are you? And tell us a little bit about how you're doing today. Are you clowning today? What are you wearing? Do you have your clown nose on while you're watching clown the conversation? That's a theme. That's a whole thing we could get into. So in a moment, I'm going to welcome these wonderful guests, Tiffany and Melissa, onto the conversation stage. But we have a couple of bits of business first. Hi, David. Hi, Cheryl. From Hearts and Noses Hospital Clown Troop in Boston. Awesome to have you here today, Cheryl. Uh, Magic the Clown from Bainbridge Island, Washington. Lovely to have you too. So the first piece of business is I want to mention that we have a free clown workshop. Hi, Kathleen. On Monday, it's at 11 a.m. Pacific time. So that's 12 noon if you're in the mountain time. That is 1 o'clock central time, 2 o'clock eastern time, 7 p.m. in the UK and 8 p.m. in Europe. <laughs> I'm getting good at this now. Free workshop. It's one hour workshop. And it's kind of an introduction to clown spirit and the way that we work, um, our whole mission. And it'll be a, also involve some embodied practice some exercises that can help bring clowning into your everyday life, which is what we're all about. So if you haven't signed up for that free workshop already, please do so. I will put the link into the chat in a bit and then um, you can sign up while we're talking. So let's see, Kathleen, hi, clowny, clowny in the house, the world's only bona fide hype clown. What, what is a hype clown? Hey, I'm supposed to be the clown expert around here. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> Tell me, what is a hype clown? I'm sure you're, on, you're one anyway. That's awesome, clowny. So the second piece of business before I bring in Melissa and Tiffany is that I've been running a competition all week. Um, to win various things and to enter this competition you had to write um write to me or on the facebook group about one moment one conversation that was your favorite moment right so we've done 50 conversations so, so to celebrate this we're going to be making some short videos some edited highlights of the conversations we wanted your input on which were your favorite moments so lots of people wrote to me um, with their favorite conversation and their favorite moment in the conversation. And they are in this hat, all those people. We've actually done several draws this week already. And this is going to be the last one. And the person who comes out of this hat is going to win a free month in our Clown for Life program, which is a membership program. It's a monthly thing. You get free, well, you get included in the, in the membership. You get clown coaching. You get a monthly workshop. You get to go to the ClownX masterclasses. You get access to all our courses. You get uh, other things, the clown library. So whoever comes out of this hat is going to win a free month in Clown for Life. 
very exciting prize. Who is it going to be? I'm not looking, I promise. I'm not cheating. Okay, here we have. I have it. Here's the one. Here's the winner. Big drum roll, everybody. Ta da! Oh, it's upside down. Brian, Brian, you won. Brian Sutherland. Brian's a good guy. He's an actor. He's a Hollywood actor. He's amazing. He's in lots of Netflix shows and he's also a clown and he lives in Portland. So I'm very happy that you won the free month in oh, a free month in Clown for Life. Well done, Brian. Woo! -hoo! Hillary. Hillary Chaplin's joined us. Hi, Hillary. All right, folks. Now is the moment you've been waiting for. I'm very, very excited about uh, my two guests. I don't normally have two. So it's very exciting. It's extra exciting that I have two guests this week and they're both wonderful people. Melissa Holland is founder and director of Dr. Clown Foundation in Montreal. And um, Tiffany Riley is the founding director of the Laughter League. And these are both exceptional um very experienced performers, therapeutic clowns, but they're also, you know, what I find amazing about uh, hospital clowning is that I, I feel like hospital clowns are the, at the front edge, at the leading edge. They're like the front line of us clowns, right? Because, you know, many of us, we, we do a lot of workshops and trainings and some of us perform in theaters and festivals for people who've paid tickets. But hospital clowns are really taking it out there into the world, right? To people who, you know, wouldn't necessarily be coming across clowns uh, in the normal course of events. And they're also, therefore, changing people's perception about what clowning is, as well as obviously having a huge impact on their life situation. And these two people, Tiffany and Melissa, are not only doing that themselves, but they're also organizing and leading and inspiring many hundreds of other people to do that in their respective organizations. So hats off to them. And I'm very, very glad to welcome them right now onto the Clamversation stage. So hello, Melissa. Hello. And hello, Tiffany. Hi. Hi, guys. <laughs> welcome. Tiffany, uh, Thank you so made us sound great. Yeah. yeah. So, so <laughs> grateful to you for uh, taking time out of your really busy lives to be with us today on this conversation. So, hi. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> Good to see you, Melissa. Nice to see you, Tiff. <laughs> Yay. You guys can do some catching up if you like as well. That's totally fine. <laughs> I like that shade of lipstick. It's very nice. Thank you. I just, um, I did mute it just a little bit. So I didn't look quite so bright. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do like red clowns right we have to we do little, that is true bread. good point <laughs> so you guys i always start with this question and it's um it's a good one i would love to know a little bit about how you each kind of entered this clown world right like how what was there a moment when you realized oh this is what i'm doing for my life or i'm a clown um who who wants to go first i guess i'll just say melissa okay um, <clears throat> I was very lucky to study uh, drama and human development at Concordia University and had a weekend workshop with Sue Morrison. So that was like a, a teaser for her longer clown through mask course. Mm. And so my, my graduation gift to myself when I finished university was to take her 90 hour uh, clown through mask course in Toronto in the summer of 1995 and uh <laughs> wow. um and cool, it, i was wondering if you'd done it before me or after me so you have quite a long time before me i was in 20 uh 2001 wow okay yeah mm. um and it was the most creative spiritual awesome work that i'd ever done and i thought wow that's amazing too bad I'll never use it in my life because I didn't want to be a circus clown or a shopping mall clown or, and I thought, uh, oh, well, maybe I'll just be able to use it in teaching drama and, and that sort of thing. It's nice to have that in my pocket. Um, 
And then I went traveling and I lived in the UK, lived in Scotland for two years Mm. and um, was teaching drama and hated it (laughs) and started to say, okay, I think I should go back to children's theater, which was really what I thought was my plan A uh, Mm. for my life and my career. Um, And so I started to look for uh, different organizations to work with in Scotland. And I came across an ad for the drama practice and they had... Uh, an or, uh, a program called Clown Doctors that they were starting. Um, and so I auditioned and interviewed and got the job there uh, with their pilot project. So the organization that's now called Hearts and Minds um, that was run by Magdalena Schamberger at the time, um, I started, so I got to start with them. So I was pretty lucky. And uh, and it was almost like the universe was knocking on my door going, oh, you remember that feeling you had when you did clown and how great it was and you thought you were never going to use it in your life? Well, you're a clown. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I was I remember Magdalena saying when I came in to hand in my my CV um, and she opened the door to the office and and uh, she just said, that's a clown. Like <laughs> she just had the feeling when I handed handed her CV that uh that that was already there so i'm i'm hoping to have magdalena on by the way um soon it'll be (laughs) great um was there um before i come to you tiffany i just have like a little follow-up question about that because so when you started doing that hospital clowning was it was it instantly clear for you like how to use the clown through mask work that you've done with sue in that context or was there sort of like a, a learning curve yeah, I mean, certainly the, the with the drama practice or Hearts and Minds at the time, um, we had a six week training program. So it was all the psychosocial aspects of what we'd encounter in the hospital, but then it was also an artistic element. So I had the baggage I had from working with with Sue, um, which definitely was was more, I'd say, about the internal spirit of the clown. Um, but working with Magdalena helped uh, hone some more uh, physical skills and, and that kind of thing to be able to uh, to bring that work into the hospital. So, so it did it did take some adaptation for sure. I was uh, pretty green <laughs> at the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Good. That's very interesting. Thank you so much, uh, yeah. Tiffany. How about you? What was your entry way into <clears throat> clown? Um, well, I uh, went to acting school. I went to NYU and uh, was going to be a serious actor. And then I moved to Los Angeles and I started taking some improv classes. And then I went to see a circus, the LA circus and the clown in the show. I It suddenly clicked for me that this guy was doing things that I love to do. He was playing music. He was doing eccentric dance. He was improvising with the audience. And so for me, that was the moment where a clown, where I understood, whoa, wow, this is so much more than whatever you think clown might have been as you were growing up. Or, you know, I was actually, I was actually uh, afraid at my third birthday of the clown my parents brought. So that's, you know, come a long way from that. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but in fair just have a big, a lot of things. But anyway, uh, so then I, I met that clown. Um, and we started working together and um, he actually asked me to choreograph. I was a dancer. He asked me to choreograph a comedy routine where it was uh, um, it, like the Chinese bike where people pile on the bike in the circus, only it was a stationary bike. So it was a comedy bit and he was going to do it with a girl. And so I did the choreography and then it was getting close time. And I said, so when is coming for a rehearsal? And he said, well, I don't really have one. Are you busy next Saturday? And so I, that was actually my uh, debut into the world clowning, um, which then I ended up falling in love with that guy. And I've been married to him for 25 years. So, oh, uh, so that yes. worked out. So, <laughs> um, and we partnered together. I, I actually fought and clawed my way in to be a partners with him because he was a very established clown already, had a lot of experience. Um, yeah. And I, uh, we moved back to New York and I auditioned for the Big Apple Circus Clown Care Unit. And um, so once I was hired by Michael Christensen, he actually then hired us to perform in the circus. So I was performing in the ring and on the hospital work. But for me, the hospital work uh, 
just brought so many things in into focus uh, in in humanity and also in uh, the the ability to realize that uh, you you're doing like 30, 30 little entrances a day. So you have like thirty chances where you you have to start over. You have to start at zero. And so doing that really helps, at least I think it helped me to develop the kind of chops as a clown to be able to then um, take that into other arenas and other shows. Because I, I think one thing I've learned through doing this for so long is that uh, all audiences have need. They may not be in the hospital, um, but, but what we do in the doorway of a hospital room is is also what we can do in front of an audience just it's on a bigger scale but it, so for me that they all come kind of together the two kinds of work and and uh, and i i never looked back i've always um i, I can't imagine doing anything else what but, is it that um that need and how did the clowns fulfill it i mean woman is looking for a connection i mean we 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 live, we thrive on connection and, and what clowns can do, I believe is, is make a connection in, in that moment, in that moment right there. And there's no baggage really. Um, I'm not, you know, it, it goes across so many different uh, ways, but I don't have a agenda. We don't have an agenda when we come in uh, as clowns, we're just there to be in that moment. And so that I think purifies the ability to connect. Mm. Yeah, period. That's very <laughs> interesting. That's great. Thank you. Um, so let's, so we, you both answered that question so beautifully and um, even answered the next question, really, which is how you got into hospital clowning. Um, and I just want to say to folks who are just joining us from home, uh, welcome. We're, we're talking, I'm talking with um, Melissa Holland and Tiffany Riley here, who are the, uh, founding directors of two major healthcare clown organizations in North America. Um, and if you have questions for them, please just throw them into the chat and we will, we will get to those and we'll include them. Uh, we've got a few more people joining us. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Lucy. Great to have you here today. So let's talk a little bit about these organizations, you guys, that you've, you've both founded an organization. Melissa, what, so what was the path for you to actually founding Dr. Clown Foundation? Like, how did it occur to you that it would be a good idea? <laughs> um, well, having worked in Scotland and having had the experience of that organization and, and it was the pilot project for them. So they were just starting out. Um, I sort of had a, a bit of a framework um, <clears throat> to go with because I lived the experience. Um, and when I moved back to Montreal uh, and saw that there were actually hospital clowns uh, established in Toronto, Winnipeg, um, and Vancouver, uh, I sort of was like, mm, well, maybe I'll just get a job at in Toronto. Or, um, but my family's here in Montreal. And anyway, I decided to move back. And um, I ended up, Magdalena knew of someone in Canada who was doing the work. Um, and he put me in touch with somebody in Montreal who was working with some guy named Hugh, Olivier, Oliver, something. And I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was meeting was with, uh, with Don Reader, actually. Uh, and so Don Reader and I uh, met a, a few times and I explained to him what my experience in Scotland had been. Um, and for whatever reason, it took about a year uh, before I actually met Olivier. And I met him. Uh, when we were going to uh, Windsor, Ontario, where Bernie Warren was setting up a program there called Fools for Health. And, uh, and so we met there and said, okay, when this summer program that I was participating in as a, as a clown uh, is over, then we'll go back to, uh, to Montreal and, and start up Dr. Clown. So Olivier had already made some inroads into uh, certain organizations. So he was working uh, at a senior's residence once in a while and bringing in some of his, his uh, artistic friends or uh, clown friends um, and uh, had tentatively worked with certain organization, but it didn't really work out. And anyway, so there'd been like some starts and stuff. And then 
uh, when I came, he put me in touch with uh, Florence Vinit, who was our, who became our other co-founder, our psychosocial director. So she uh, had known Le Rire Médecin in France. And so she could talk very intelligently about the benefits, the psychological benefits, et cetera. Um, and Germaine Gibara, who was our four, fourth co-founder. And she's, uh, she was a very high powered businesswoman who had met Olivier at a Christmas party and said, I'm going to help you start that organization. Oh, we all need that. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Um, she unfortunately passed away uh, in 2010, but um, mm. she, yeah, it was definitely a, a big, a big factor in helping us get off the ground. Um, so honestly, when, when I got back from that summer in Windsor, Ontario, there were already um, feelers and things uh, going out. And I know yeah. Um, when I started to talk to my mom about it, she was like, oh, well, you should talk to uh, the, her priest had a friend who was a philanthropist. And anyway, uh, Olivia and I like to tell the story of going to her office on the 24th floor of a big business tower building in downtown Montreal with our bicycle helmets and our orange duotang <laughs> that had our, our project written out. And uh, she said, oh, that's great. I'd, I'd love to hear more about it. It seems very interesting. Um, I'd love to see your business plan. <laughs> Olivia and I both looked at each other and went, what's a business plan? <laughs> <laughs> so literally, we left that meeting, went to the bookstore on the corner and bought a book on how to write a business plan. Um, and there was mm -hmm. an organization called Youth Employment Services that was helping young entrepreneurs. They had a contest for best business plan. They helped us. I mean, we had the writing all okay, but it was the numbers that were a little hard to. Yeah. <laughs> to yeah. It's always the numbers, right? Yeah. And, uh, and we ended up winning in 2002 for the best business plan of, <clears throat> uh, of that year for the mayor's wow. foundation for youth. So we got a startup grant and um, that's, that's how that, those are the, the little, that's, yeah. that's the short version of getting that going. <laughs> so what, what, for you, what does the organization represent i mean what is what is the the the, the heart what is at the heart and the juice of, of this particular organization as compared to maybe you know other clown or healthcare clown organizations is there something that that you would say characterizes who you are hmm. <clears throat> i think our initially when we started it we were very conscious of it being a hybrid of the um, Canadian model of therapeutic clowning that existed already, which was more of a solo model. Um, but it was, it was all about empowerment. It was all about um, the clown is the one that doesn't know. And the patient is the one that has to uh, help, yeah. help the clown, help the individual. So we really liked that aspect of the clown being the low man on the totem pole. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so even though we had skills to offer and we were a duo and um, had an idea of improvisation and, and how this could work, there's an idea that that at the base of it, we always want to have something where the, the patient is able to participate as the, have control over the improvisation. Mm. Um, and, and for <clears throat> us as well, because of my experience in Scotland and the model was based on the Big Apple Circus and the Rire Médecin, so being a duo um, and having uh, artistic training uh, and psychosocial training. <clears throat> so we were able to, to blend those two together to really um, have the artistic skills, but always have the notion that uh, it's a participatory mm. uh, thing. Very cool. Um, in a minute, um, I'm going to also ask you about how to become a hospital clown. There's another question about that. But I want to just hop over to Tiffany. So same question, <laughs> Tiffany, really. Um, wh what was it that led to the founding of the Laughter League? And then could you tell us a little bit about just, you know, sort of a back of a postage stamp version of what Laughter League yeah. is? Sure. Um, so... It was a couple of years after 9-11 and we had been touring with the Big Apple Circus and we came back to New York where there was like zero, literally air in lower Manhattan, but also no real work for variety artists. It was a challenging time, at which point we discovered we were pregnant with our second child. So we decided to move to Texas to be closer to my parents. 
And uh, within a few weeks of arriving there, um, a friend of mine, Brenda Marshall, called and said that the hospital here has some seed money and they'd like to, to meet with you and see if you would consider uh, launching a hospital clown program at Children's Medical Center in Dallas. And wow. so I said, well, sure, I'd be, I mean, I, it had never crossed my mind to do that. And I probably, I don't know what would have happened if that hadn't come to pass. But mm. so we, we started our program there. That was in um, 2005. And that program grew from being um, two clowns working two days a week, but that's how much money we had. Uh, it grew to become seven days a week with 14 clowns on the roster and two facilities and then expanded to another hospital uh, about 30 miles away in a town called Fort Worth. Uh, Gateway to the West. No, that's St. Louis. Anyway, um, <laughs> so we, we uh, that work all, all along and collaborating with other friends and other organizations. Uh, we rebranded ourselves as the Laughter League when we... Um, took on the program at Boston Children's Hospital after the uh, Big Apple Circus um, became no longer. Uh, and so from there, we, we now, it's, it's just, I, I would say that um, it became a passion during those first few years uh, between the 2005 and 2008 in that, in that time frame. there. Um, just the, the, the development of a team, the realization that we could work as an ensemble. We still work in teams of two, just like the Big Apple, the same, same uh, type of format. Um, at a certain point, we um, were introduced to the Dream Doctors because we shared a donor with them. And so we, we had a lot of uh, how do we grow beyond that, which is uh, when we got, the first time I went to an international conference was in Israel. That's where the first time Melissa, uh, and Carolyn Simons was always a mentor, just kept, you know, there's a lot of great mentors in this world of this work mm. who will say, just keep, keep putting it out there. Keep doing good work, mm. keep doing good work. And um, I think that's, I think that has a lot to do with where we are today. So we, we have, um, we grew a lot this year. We have now, we have uh, 35 clowns in five different states in the country. And I would say that, um, the heart for, for us is in um, tr providing good training, but also trusting that the clowns that we work with have just as much passion and commitment to the work as the founders do. Um, because I, I think you need that because I, they're the one every day. I mean, I work as much as I can in the hospital, but without them, um, we're nothing. Without those clowns mm -hmm. that bring their their breadth of experience and their their commitment to the work i i think we're nothing so i i think i think it happens naturally but i think it i think laughter league what i i think what i wish for laughter league is that it it has a legacy that that goes way beyond the lives of the of the founders and even the next generation so in order to do that i think at least we work every day and making sure that our performers feel invested in what we're doing and it's not just mm -hmm. a job because well it's not just a job first of all because mm -hmm. a job would probably pay better but, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's a calling it's a definite calling um, yeah. and I just you know just it's a constant growth I mean it's a it's a constant thing about being able to listen to to what's going on and you can only do that with with a, a with a solid group of folks that will get back to you and say, "Hey, uh, yeah, there's you know, I don't know if I answered your question. I kind of yeah, you, totally. It's very interesting laughter league to me because uh, many healthcare uh, clowning organizations are sort of local to a particular area and they work in particular hospitals. And you guys just seem to be kind of well, more of a lead, like a network. Like you have you have people all over the country and presumably." having their own relationships with, with hospitals and institutions. That it's, it, yeah, it's, um, it is very true. Um, I would say that not only does every city have a different culture, but even hospitals in the same city have a different culture. And so uh, it's important that you have people there that understand that. Also, I, honestly, it's not like we went out looking for that. We were in the North Texas area, um, but things kind of, you know, the clown world is very small, as I'm sure you're, you're learning. And so we have colleagues 
both in the clown business and also in the world of child life, which is something that's pretty, pretty big. And that first hospital we were at was a teaching hospital. So mm. most of the child life specialists that we worked with when we started, they're now directors at other hospitals. And so, oh, cool. I mean, you know, one of them we're working with right now, she's been for five years been saying, I, I want you to have a program here. I want to work with you. I, I just got to find the money and all those things. So it's, it's, again, it's, it's about relationships. Um, and also yeah. about talent. There's, there's some, there's some talent out there that have the commitment to do it. Otherwise, I, I don't think we could pull it off. Honestly, it's a, it's hard. <laughs> uh, and we're a small um, community, as you said, but we're growing. Um, yeah. Clowns in general, and the interest in it is growing. You know, I feel that. Um, and I had a somebody wrote a comment underneath one of the posts publicizing this conversation, saying, "This is what I want to do." Um, I'm willing to move. How do I get started? So it kind of raised this question for me. Okay, so let's say somebody's listening to this and they really want to get involved in hospital clowning and they're willing to move. Um, is that even necessary? Or, you know, what would be your advice? How could they get started? Maybe I'll come back to you, Melissa. Well, <laughs> um I think that's one of the things that that differs a lot, I think, in, in experiences and stuff. Um, <clears throat> I can speak to uh, our organization and what we're looking for. Mm. Um, so we're looking for people who are um, performers, who have gone to get clown training, who have um, gone to a master class, who have a clown persona, a clown character. Um, and at least, yeah, at least two years experience um, working as a clown, either on stage or in festivals or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that. also, sorry? So if, with a person, let's say they have that. What yeah. That? And then also to have demonstrated in their life experience resume, um, a mm -hmm. desire to have some kind of relational, uh, some kind of relational work, whether it be uh, volunteering or teaching or having already worked in healthcare or worked with a vulnerable population um, yeah. so that we have the notion that it's not just a performer who's looking for something to add to their bread and butter, but who actually do have a keen interest in using their art uh, in a service kind of um, objective. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, so I'd say get some good clown training, <laughs> have some experience in, in, in doing clown. Uh, and then what we do is we have an audition, a big group audition, uh, and then we'll um, break it down so that there's, I don't know, maybe seven or eight people that we'll invite to the hospital uh, and have an in-situ um, so that they as well see, because I mean, for a lot of performers, they think it might be a good thing, but when they get there, it might, oh, yeah. okay, now I see for me. <laughs> what this, yeah, what the reality of it can be. Mm. Um, so to feel, are they comfortable in, in that situation? Is it something they feel they can grow into? Um, and of course we, ha and we have a very in-depth interview process as well. <clears throat> Wonderful. Rob says, hi, Tiffany. Uh, Rob, <laughs> Rob Divers, Divers. Yes, hi Rob, Nurse Rob. Nurse uh, Rob, <laughs> welcome. Um, and David says, love the shout out to Child Life. In Canada in 1986, therapeutic clowning started as a Child Life program. Huh. Yep. Certainly did. Good. By the yeah. Good piece of healthcare clown trivia there. <laughs> well, I'm, I mean, Melissa probably could speak more to this, but Karen Ridd, who is largely considered one of the founders of this work, was a child life specialist. And I, I mean, I don't know how she did it, honestly, to be a child life specialist one day and a clown another day. But um, she certainly and I think they still that's still out there. But I mean, she certainly laid a lot of groundwork for a lot of us that are working today. No yes. question there. Yeah. No question. Yeah, and I, I don't think she was, maybe David can clarify. I don't think she was a child life specialist, but she did work with the child life department. Yeah, I think David would know. Yeah. Um, um, go on, Tiffany. Yes, please. So about the training. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, a couple of years ago, I would have pretty pretty much answered exactly the same way that Elizabeth, uh, that Elizabeth, who are you? 
Is it Elizabeth? <laughs> it's Elizabeth. That <laughs> Melissa, sorry. Um, and Melissa, and that is all still true. Um, I think that just from a training perspective, if you want to do this work, if you're interested in doing this work, I, I personally think um, take an improv class, take improv, study improvisation. Um, because I really think that uh, having good listening skills and being a good improviser are two of the most important ingredients uh, that you have to develop because you you have to be able to improvise because if you have a great act, it, it, it's great. I can do this juggling thing and all the kids are gonna love it. It's gonna be great. But if that kid or parent is using back that's saying, this is not, this is not it, you have to be willing to drop that agenda like, like immediately and pivot and change directions, um, which mm. That if you don't have a, a toolkit that includes improvisation, I don't think I think it's harder to do that. Um, so it's it's a lot of different skill sets that come together. But I do think that that's a good first step for for anybody that's interested in in doing this work if they don't have any any training or any background. Um, so we have at Laughter League have been focusing a lot on um, how we can expand. Um, expand the talent pool to include a more diverse group of individuals because the clown world is is pretty white it just it, mm -hmm. it is and there's a lot of reasons for that historically uh and the and how the clown is perceived and all of the the different things that are involved in that um which has led us to look at different terms to you you know it's the word clown is a difficult one uh in mm -hmm. in many in many cases um but I would say that our commitment um, now in recruiting people and looking for people is to try and make sure that we are um, representing something that anyone would be interested in pursuing. Mm. Um, and, but, and along with that will come people who have really don't have the same background as, as we do. They, uh, you know, that was the people that have studied juggling and circus and so, how do you look into, well, what are some incredible talent uh, bases that some other people have and how can we, how can it be come evident to them that this is a place where I can take my gifts um, into the hospital? And so it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of a bigger, it's just become a bigger thing. But, you know, one example is we hired a woman in, in Boston last year. She is a really amazing storyteller and musician. She never thought that she was a clown, but I can tell you she's a clown, but it just needed to it just needed to be tapped on, hey, what, oh, that's great. That story, that's so fun. That's all, you're already doing this. You're already doing the thing that goes beyond the word clown, which is to engage with the people that we meet in the hospital, to be in that moment, to be complicit with the person in the room and allow moments to happen. Um, Beautiful. I, yeah, the training is important. And so I think Melissa too, we're all committed to how can we do more training and how can we, yeah. shouldn't there be a school? And well, yeah, just to call the person and I mean, the reason that Melissa and I are close now is because of Emily who, who was, who passed away last year. And, but she did actually have this certificate program in, in Toronto that was started. And I think I think a lot of us who are leaders in this work are looking for that. What is that? What is that training program? Where could that, where could that live? I know mm. there is one, Carolyn has one in France. Um, we're working in on North one. America. And we're, yeah. So, so I think it is because it's not just the clowning that you need to understand. You need to, you need to also learn about developmental stages of children and what, ha what is behavioral health and how does autism and how do we, and we all do that. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not formalized. We 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 bring in experts. We do all kinds of training. Um, but but I think there's a lot of people out there that would love to see some formalized training. That's amazing. So you're not talking about clown, just clown training. You're talking about hospital clown training, healthcare yeah. clown training. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing goal. I love it. Yeah. Well, we we're working on it in in Montreal. We have our uh, La Fac, which is the um, formation on all clownesque, so training for clowns. So it. It involves two different, uh, so we have the, what we call the recreational venue for clown training and the professional uh, venue for clown training. And then uh, on top of that, we're, we're working on developing the therapeutic clown uh, training. Because most people that come to us, of course, are interested in therapeutic clowning and ultimately want to do that 
So that's like in a, a second stage that we're, we're looking at. I love that, Melissa, because I, I think one of the things that we talked about is if you have a degree in clowning and in the first year you are learning all about clowning and then in the second year, whatever you can take, you're, you can go in those directions. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's, well, I'm moving to Montreal. That's Yay. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Fire. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> Hey, Caroline. Caroline's on. Hi, Caroline. Oh. Hi, Caroline. <laughs> Hi, Caroline. I, I realized that I've been saying Simmons all the time, and maybe it's supposed to be Simons. And you guys, because I, I had, I think you, Tiffany, said I Simons. always say Simons, and she doesn't hit me when I say it. So, no. Well, she didn't she, hit me when she... I said Simmons, but we were on. on... <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't. I think maybe she likes she hit... the mystery of it. <laughs> Well, I apologize, Caroline, for saying, Ka or Caroline. Caroline. It's Caroline. <laughs> yes. Pardonnez-moi. <laughs> Por favor. I'm getting very confused now. <laughs> okay, linguistically, linguistic confusion happening. Um, we can, beautiful comments. Uh, Laurie says, I see and appreciate this commitment and training and diversity for us moving forward. Beautiful. Mm. And Cheryl says, um, see, I can put it up here. The oh, more okay. I learned about this work, much in Tiffany and Dick's workshops, Dick is your partner, right, Tiffany? Yeah. Yes, that you had mentioned earlier. The more I know, there is more to learn. Yeah, <laughs> it's like what we know, we don't know. What we don't know, we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> that old chestnut. Oh, yeah, and, um, that old chestnut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just came on, ladies, Caroline says. And Mal, good to hear this conversation. Hi, Mal. All right, we're going to have to start here. over. Caroline just started, so. Oh, no. Why did we start? I can't remember. Well, one uh, thing that was funny that you said, Tiffany, was that, you know, you wanted to be a serious actor. And I remember Caroline saying the same thing in the conversation. And I think Hillary Chaplin said the same thing as well. In fact, quite a few people have said that. I didn't say it, but I had that too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you both come yeah. from that drama school background. Yeah. Um, so proud of you, ladies, Carolyn says. I'm just going to mm -hmm. put that up so you can just bask in that. Uh, Except it's per, 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 per proud of you, ladies. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Carolyn, she's drunk again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Melissa. <laughs> well, she's in France. She can't help it. <laughs> it's very difficult not to be in France. Mm -hmm. New York Goofs, uh, Rob says, New York Goof provides world-class training yes indeed yep we love the new york goofs we have to have hillary back on one of these days hope you're well hillary joanna says oh hu oh hu hillary i don't know what that means i think you mean oh hi okay <laughs> so <laughs> where was i um i think i want to ask for questions now you you guys who are listening we've only got about 15 minutes left and this has all been about my questions so far, which I know are brilliant and intellectual, but you have some lots of interesting questions to ask. So why don't you go ahead and put them into the chat, what you would like to ask Melissa and Tiffany. How, okay, here's Lucy. How has the pandemic affected your, oh no, not that one. How has the pandemic affected your therapeutic programs? Anybody want to comment? A lot. I'm sure. <laughs> so many things. Yeah. Are you are you guys back to normal, Tiff? Like in terms of Yeah. We are. And we, you know, we had an interesting uh situation that our hospital in Texas, Texas, um, we were only uh at home for eight weeks. They we were back in the hospital um by June by the beginning of June, uh at the beginning of, and the reason was uh we had been doing regular work with the behavioral health uh, group, the in inpatient psych and the partial hospital and the psych director called the person in charge and said, why we need these clowns. This is, this is really bad. The kids are really stressed. Wh where are they? And we got a call and, and we were back there five days a week that whole time, um, which, was, which was a great big gift. It was wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. But every other hospital, you know, it took us, uh, we weren't back for like a year. It took a year. So we all had to, you know, we did a lot of things. We did nose to nose visits. We did uh, Zoom calls with kids. They, 
I think we all were like, oh no, this is never going to work. But uh, I, I said earlier something about pivoting. Um, and I think that is uh, something that clowns do very well. We can drop our agenda. On, what? That's not the situation. Oh, well, just give us a minute. We'll figure it out. I think it's one of the reasons why the, the clown figure has been around for forever is because we adapt to whatever is happening. So I don't, there was a lot of, there were a lot of gifts. There are only gifts. And that was, uh, we got through it and we're really, we are back live in all of our places now. Are you, Melissa? What mm -hmm. you are, right? Yeah, yeah, we are too. We, I mean, I think the mask uh, is permanent. I think we're always going to have to wear a mask, <clears throat> whether there's an outbreak in the hospital or not, or the seniors residents. So that's, that's a big thing that's, that's changed in terms of not being able to blow bubbles or play a flute or, you know, that, that, or for mm. just communication for a lot of seniors, uh, being able to read our lips is, is really pivotal to, to comprehension and not just seniors, but, you know, people with special needs. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's really changed a lot the way we, we interact, uh, I find, but, um, but in the, the height of the pandemic, uh, we closed everything March 13th and by March 23rd, we were up and running online. Um, so we had, wow. we had a program. Yeah. We had an amazing team communications team who found a platform for us to work on. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and to put the word out to the hospitals and the seniors residences and to develop, a where, you know, okay, we'll be, pre the clowns will be present for six hours on these days, um, sign up for your appointment. Uh, so it was really, and, and as, as Tiffany said, it was a huge learning curve for all of us. And it was kind of nice actually all being in the same boat of, hey, you know what, I tried this and this really worked. And, uh, you know, whether like suddenly this, this, you know, we've done work in hospitals in, in windows <laughs> for, um, people in oncology whose immune systems are suppressed and you can't actually go into the room. So, you know, we had some notion of, you know, it, it being sort of like a puppet show uh, and that this was now our, our framework and how to work within it. Yeah. Um, but for sure it was, we were, we were surprised at how much it did work, how much the therapeutic element could still be present. Uh, we actually had uh, some students from McGill uh, university do some research with, for us to see is the therapeutic element there and the conclusion was yes uh, it doesn't replace in-person visits of course but um, but you know being able to for in some elements I think uh, as for some populations um, children with autism in particular I think it somewhat facilitated communication because they were it was a screen and it was somehow easier to interact in a um and in in real in real life in real time mm -hmm. um it, for seniors it was a lot more difficult of course because the technology in general is not their number one go-to way of <laughs> communicating so that was that was a bit more challenging mm -hmm. um and so we really relied on the point person on the person who was bringing the tablet around to uh to the different seniors to be the the bridge of communication um, and the thing that, and of course, you know, we, we could only go on what we could see on the face and the shoulders, but we didn't know what was going on in the background, who else was in the room, if their toe was tapping when we were doing, you know, mm. so it was very limited in terms of, of you're missing that. a lot of those crucial signs that you, you would normally be reading. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, and we were out for a year and a half, um, as subcontractors of the hospital, mm. um, certainly any subcontractors were like, no, we just need the staff. And so I was very jealous of my Canadian colleagues across Canada who who are employees of the hospital and were uh, deemed essential workers and were able to stay on uh, during the whole pandemic. And I just thought, wow, that's amazing that they get to do that, <laughs> and that they, they can be there. Um, and when we finally got back into the hospitals a year and a half later, uh, the response from the staff uh, who missed us and, you know, we were practically in tears when they saw us and, and realizing what the impact had been on them, uh, you know, as, as yeah. frontline workers and how, 
um, how much they needed you in that moment. How much they needed um, us and how much we weren't there. And I think when they saw us, it just, that that need and everything just sort of came to them like, holy crap, this has been hard and heavy. <laughs> We've been carrying this a long time and we need some fresh air. We need some humor. We need big time to be able to to carry on. Gosh, that's that's wonderful. It's wonderful just to hear how much you were valued in the first place, you know, how yeah. much established that rapport and connection with people that they coming back was such a big deal yeah it's just wonderful um there was a great question i think from caroline which i'm just going to scroll back to oh yes this is a good one how do you see the yeah. profession in 10 years when i'm <clears throat> 83 <laughs> Anyone in body, away? but not in spirit. <laughs> right, totally. In ten years, yeah. How things, gonna, how things gonna change? Especially if we have this amazing uh, clown hospital clown training school. Well, I think the diversity that you're talking about, Tiffany, is going to be a key, yeah, key element for sure. I'm hoping will be a key element. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean. Um, that's paramount and that, and that's how long it will take, I think really, you know, uh, to, to represent the diversity that we see in the hospital. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a long process that, that piece. Um, but I think that would be one really great key. I, I think, I mean, I always want to see a day where it's not a surprise that there's clowns in a hospital, but more, of an expectation mm. that that they're everywhere, and in order to do that, the work is more than cut out for us um, because we have to convince, at least in the United States, you know, we have to convince uh, the medical world that yes, it should be everywhere. I, I think we've we've come a long way um, because now a lot of young doctors and young professionals have done their internships at a hospital where there was a professional clown program. Like there's mm -hmm. a way better chance that that's happened. And so you need to work quite as hard to get them on your side when they've already experienced it. What, you know, they, it's part of their, it's like, it's like a kid with a cell phone. Like when we learned how to use cell phones, it was like a, a, a process and what the kids were just born in it in their hand. They don't even think twice about it. They can do everything on it. So mm -hmm. I, I think there's a similar sort of a parallel thing. If, if I was a doctor and when I was 50 years old, they started bringing clowns around. I'm like, why do we need this? You know, I can see that whole thing. Whereas if they were always there from the time that I was uh, an intern and a fellow and all those things, then, then it's, it's, it's part of the, it's part of the culture of being in that world. I also think we are, there is a lot more focus on uh, yes. And what Carolyn said, they like us, do they need us? Absolutely. 100%. Um, I actually think we have a really a good tipping point opportunity, um, and I would welcome a call from Carolyn later to talk about it, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is um, the the behavioral health crisis that we're facing. We at Laughter League we have been uh, called to be uh, partners in the, uh, those clinics and those inpatient and outpatient um, facilities in all of the hospitals that we are currently in. Those directors, they, they need us. And they, they've said that. Um, so in my mind, if we can figure out a way to turn that into some real, like, tangible, uh, the impact that we have, and we do have that impact on kids who are going through crisis, because, and I think it's because they see us, they don't, they're not, we're not their parents, and we're not the physicians, we're, we're an other, we're an other. Oh, she's going to make dinner. Okay, fine. Bye, Carolyn. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we we're we can cut through that, and I think we have a unique we have a unique opportunity to have a really positive impact on uh, kids and teens that are going through um, behavioral health issues, which is a lot of people right now. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'd say for sorry, just to to get yeah, that, that question um, along with the diversity. Uh, in terms of the people who are doing this work, also diversity in, in terms of the different populations that we serve. So we've already started doing that work in that, you know, we started working with seniors uh, when we first started. So we work with seniors, with children, uh, with adults in uh, general 
care, uh, adults with mental health issues, children with mental health issues, adults in palliative care, um, and with uh, children uh, with autism, and in schools for kids with special needs. So that's that's where we're at now, and that being being diverse like that has uh, honed different skills, different um, needs and objectives that those different populations need, and. And I think it's it's stimulating work, and and it helps uh, have the feeling that okay, we can we can keep developing. And is there a limit in terms of who we can visit? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, already looking at uh, visiting children in in women's shelters, and I know there's there's clowns that, uh, mm-hmm. that do that mm-hmm. as well. Uh, I know Clowns Without Borders uh, goes to um, uh, places that have been hit by war or other mm-hmm. traumas. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, I was at a, a conference, a healthcare clown conference in Toronto uh, many years ago, and Wellington Noguera from the Torres de Alegria was there. Uh, and, and he was saying, like, if he had a picture of himself at a, uh, as a clown in the New York Stock Exchange <laughs> with the stockbrokers there. And if we take the uh, this and this was Wellington saying this that if we take the metaphor that the world is sick, <laughs> then mm. like, the whole world is basically in the hospital. And how can the clown affect uh, affect society as a whole? Uh, what are the what are the, yeah. the things that can that this can or that the clown like can that. do? Beautiful. Mm-hmm. I always think also that the clown, the benefits of clown are not something that you only get by seeing a clown, but by doing clowning yourself. Mm-hmm. So one thing that I'm, you know, trying to do is to um, help people access that quality and that state for themselves and, and, and finding the benefit from that as well. Right. So there's two ways, you know, we can train clowns and we can get them out there more. Into, and I, I love this notion that hospital clowning could be this, this um, sort of, what's the word like a like a spark it could be the the point of foundation for a lot of other kinds of spaces that we could push clowns out into as -hmm. you mentioned you know and but hospital clowning it feels to me is kind of the most widely accepted and sort of supported uh example of this but we could take that and sort of expand it out both as you were saying tiffany in terms of diversity of the clowns themselves and the kinds of the kinds of practices they're doing, because it doesn't just have to be traditional clowning, right? We, as you said, it, there can be music, there can be storytelling, there can be all these other, um, you know. And a few centuries ago, there wasn't the there weren't these such clear boundaries between this is a clown and this is a musician. You know, mm-hmm. jongleurs and minstrels were people who who did all these things. They were funny and they were musicians and they were connected with people. So there's this kind of diversity but then also the diversity you were talking about melissa where where are we going as clowns it doesn't have to be just hospitals we're branching Mm -hmm. out so this is this is awesome i'm just feeling so excited and inspired (laughs) by you guys right now um there's there's a question oh here we are catherine catherine larue says what are some of the latest studies and research going on about this work? And we only have a couple of minutes left, guys. So I don't know. Do you have some that you can point to? Some studies? Uh, well, there was the one that I hopefully will be published soon on that uh, many um, people from NAFCO participated in, um, in the effect of clowning with seniors. Um, so it was based on interviews from the clowns. Uh, I think it would be great to have one where we could try to get the perspective of, of the residents themselves. Um, but, uh, that should be published soon, hopefully. Uh, and, um, the other one was resonance that we worked on. So this was, uh, again, with a group of people from, um, professor from McGill, um, where we participated in, uh, this assemblage of technology. Uh, so, it was an EEG helmet thing that was placed on uh, patients who had uh, who were non-responsive, yeah. um, and uh, introducing the clown, uh, two clowns to improvise, create stories, imagination based mm-hmm. on their 
real life experience and to see uh, what areas of the brain were firing off and if there was some kind of connection that was being made and then later be able wow. to use that. Fascinating. Uh, yeah. So that's yeah. in a nutshell, but um, that's my minimal knowledge at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Tiffany, you're aware of anything that people should read? Um, I mean, the things that Melissa said, I've, I've heard yeah. her talk about some of them. They're, they're amazing. Um, I think that um, it's, it's always been a challenge to get good research that is uh, mm. not anecdotal and yeah. that doesn't apparently fly for uh, at least in America, you know, um, there's always, I mean, there's a lot of research out of the dream doctors in Israel. They, they have a lot of things. There's some, some so Arjun Amnon wrote a, just uh, his, his new book is out. So Amnon Raviv. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. I'm not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Argentina had a, had a, had a pretty good research um, project a couple of years ago. I think um, for us, we're we're working on putting the pieces in place to do a research project on uh, the impact clowns have with uh, the behavioral health pop population. But uh, so any experts in that area that want to get in touch with me, yes. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> we're looking at one as well for, uh, soon on palliative care for adults and researching that. Amazing. Well, guys, we've kind of reached the end of our time and I feel like I have so many more things to to, to ask you but maybe it's good because we you know clowns right we leave them wanting more <laughs> <laughs> that's right so um yeah i just want to say thank you so much for coming on and having this conversation with all of us today it's been really inspiring i think the thing that sticks with me is this idea that we are we're so good as, as clowns at pivoting i love that mm. you know that we're we have this ability to, when something doesn't go right, to very quickly go, oh, no problem. Just give me a second. Oh, how about this? <laughs> <laughs> yep. I love Here we that. go. <laughs> Here we Thank go. you so much. Thank you, Barnaby. Thank yeah, so you for the Barnaby. invite and for this whole platform. It's quite quite amazing community that you're you're building here. Thank you. Well, please, yeah. please stay connected because, you know, it's great to have uh, all the folks at all levels inspiring one another so please stay connected with the community and maybe come back and do another conversation absolutely sounds good to. thanks <laughs> for having us all right thank you guys thank you thank you okay everybody thank you so much for joining again for another conversation today it was a lovely chat wasn't it it was so great and so so much to take away and be inspired by and positivity and thanks for all your comments and your questions and joining in and for your support. Well done to Brian, who won the competition today for a free month in the Clown for Life membership. And don't forget the free workshop on Monday, folks. That's happening. Free workshop, one hour with me. And you can sign up for that. Um, uh, if you just wait, bear with me for uh, about five seconds. I'm actually going to put the link for that in the... Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. I'm very slow today. Yeah, you see that? That is the link, folks. If you click on that, it takes you to the registration page for the free workshop on Monday. And then you'll get all the, the Zoom link and the details and everything. So yeah, every now and then I do free workshops and it's a way of just, you know, giving everybody access at whatever level resources you have. The point is to, to try to get clowns out there, right? To unleash as many clowns into the world as possible. That's what we're all about. So thanks, everybody. Hope to see you at a conversation very soon. Next week, we have a very, very exciting guest. We have the amazing Jos Huben, who is a star of the clown world, the clown training world, a uh, uh, veteran clown teacher and performer, an amazing guy, Jos Huben. So tune in again this same time next week, same place for another conversation. Lovely to have you, everybody. Bye-bye for now. Keep clowning.